Hello, world history students. This is your last week of distance learning. I hope you guys had a nice time learning some new stuff and reviewing some other lessons that we had earlier this year. Um, this video, we're going to focus on the scientific revolution and um, how that came to be and how that affected um, populations in Europe and other countries. Okay, so we're going to get right into it. Think about how quickly science and technology change. It wasn't so long ago that cell phones were exclusively used for making calls and the occasional text. Today, you can do almost anything on them. Technology is practically changing overnight, and we had a revolution 500 years ago to thank for it. Before the 15th century, human understanding of science was very limited. Ancient ideas were still accepted, and what couldn't be explained by science was often explained by the church. Remember the Black Death? The plague in Europe was thought to be a result of humankind's past sins. You should recall reading and learning about the Renaissance, right? We learned about Michael Angelo and the Sistine Chapel. We learned about all the different literature and art at that time. So this was a time in history when people's thinking was being changed. The classics from Greece and Rome were found and read with new interest. People started living for themselves instead of living only to serve God. We talked about the reformation of the church and the Catholic church. In fact, people began to openly question the church now and its long held ideas. There was an explosion of artwork in the form of paintings, sculptures, and plays. But art wasn't the only area that showed great change. The great thinkers of science forever changed the way we looked at everything, from the human body to outer space. One of the greatest achievements in the so-called scientific revolution can be attributed to followers of Islam or Muslims. Their Arabic language became the language of science. Even the terms algebra and algorithm are thanks to Muslim mathematics. We use Arabic numbers instead of Roman numerals in everything from math to shopping. Muslim colleges were started in the seventh century. Before the end of the first millennium, Cordoba may have had a library that boasted nearly half a million books. Historians point out that Muslim scholars kept scientific thinking alive and helped grow knowledge, while Christians closed itself off from this type of thinking. It wasn't until the 13th century that Christian monks and others from the field of religion began to look closely at the natural world. Copernicus of the sun-centered model was a Catholic astronomer. Francis Bacon, Galileo Galilei, and Isaac Newton were Christian scientists who left permanent marks on both the field of science and religion. Jews were able to add a lot of knowledge to the scientific fields because of the tolerance shown by Muslim leaders on the Iberian Peninsula. We talked about that last week as well. Jewish medical students filled the universities and took positions as doctors all across Europe. Global exploration was another key foundation of the scientific revolution. Explorers needed knowledge and instruments to help them reach their goals. Scientists and inventors created tools like the astrolab, telescope, and barometer to aid exploration. Magnetic compasses allowed for better navigation and precise timepieces helped in crewing the ships. Detailed maps were created to provide safer routes for sailing. Scientists found a treasure trove of information when the new continents were discovered. New plant life found in the Americas kept botanists busy for quite a while as they cataloged new vegetables, grains, and herbs that could be used in cooking and in medicine. New animals and insects further fueled the revolution. In 1585, the first European settlers on Roanoke Island wrote descriptions of black bears, mule deer, and horseshoe crabs. Captain John Smith of the Jamestown colony in America wrote of flying squirrels, muskrats, and raccoons. From South America came the first description of pumas, llamas, vicunas, and skunks. Around the same time, the first English language book on beekeeping was published. In it, the author explains that it is the queen bee and not the king bee that led the colony. Robert Hooke, using a microscope and his artistic talents, published a book of incredibly detailed insect drawings. 
The science and technology that we embrace today can be traced back to those days when people started questioning the world around them. All right. So let's talk about the sun, the stars, and the moon. Humans have always looked to the sky. We studied the moon, stars, and other planets and created legends to explain what we were seeing. We all agreed that the sun rose in the east and set in the west. Then why was it so difficult to understand that the sun wasn't moving, but we were? The ancients spoke of chariots pulling the sun across the sky, and Amer American Indian legends told of a sun that visited other places during the nighttime. In the early 1500s, Nicholas Copernicus turned the world upside down and challenged thousands of years of thinking with his idea of a heliocentric or sun-centered solar system. Before it was believed that the earth, um, the sun revolved around the earth, that the earth was the epicenter of the universe. So he proved that wrong. To many, the idea that earth wasn't at the center of the universe was almost blasphemy at the time. Then, in the 17th century, Galileo Galilei, an Italian physicist and astronomer, studied the moon and other planets using a device he invented, the telescope. He determined that the moon was not smooth, but full of craters and mountains. He studied the phases of Venus as well. His discoveries helped prove Copernicus right, but it cost him. He was arrested during the Inquisition and sentenced to house arrest for the rest of his life. We talked about that last week, right? For stargazers, the motion of Mars was baffling. At times, it seemed to actually move in a different direction. By studying the red planet for nearly eight years, Johannes Kepler was able to come up with Kepler's first law of planetary motion. He added two other laws that describe planetary speed and motion based on distance from the sun and was the first astronomer to use the term satellite. The German also invented eyeglasses to treat both near and far-sighted vision. An English scientist named Isaac Newton, an astronomer, mathematician, and inventor, may have been the most important person to come out of the scientific revolution, and he's probably the most well-known person. Newton's laws of motion are the basis of physics, and he developed a new field of mathematics known as calculus, the bane of every math student's existence, calculus. His law of universal gravitation described gravity as a force that acted upon all objects in the universe. His reflecting telescope is the main one used today. Besides the telescope, the microscope made its debut around this time as well. It's unclear exactly who can be credited with this invention. Both Galileo and Robert Hooke worked on it, but Hooke was the first one to use the term cell. Antoine van Leeuwenhoek created powerful single lens microscopes that could magnify an object 270 times its size. Other great inventions of the time include the thermometer and the barometer. The questions posed so long ago have inspired generations to keep asking questions and searching for answers. All right, so let's talk about the scientific method. You guys use this in science to answer questions and to make hypotheses. So back in 1620, around the time the pilgrims were arriving in the Americas, Francis Bacon, an English philosopher and politician, devised an important scientific system. He promoted what we now call the scientific method, in which certain steps must be taken to prove that something is true. Bacon believed most people must doubt everything at first. Data needed to be collected, observations needed to be made, and then a conclusion can be drawn. Another philosopher, René Descartes, was also vital to the scientific revolution. He wrote in 1637 that there are four things that must occur to prove a truth. One, doubt everything. Two, break down difficult problems into smaller steps. Three, solve the easiest problems first before tackling the harder ones. And four, be thorough, checking and rechecking to ensure no mistakes have been made. The late Middle Ages was a time of great change, promoting people to challenge existing authority. Universities were growing, people were eager to experiment, and explorers like Columbus were proving existing theories about Earth incorrect. How did the scientific thinking sit with religious leaders? 
Many of the new ideas upset religious leaders. Galileo was even tried for heresy and convicted, never to experiment again. Isaac Newton might have upset some in the church when he wrote in his Principi, Principal Mathematica, Mathematica, that book name, well, oh, sorry, that the planets revolved around the sun and were held there by a force called gravity, the same force that caused things to fall on earth. He tempered the statement by stating that only God could have, create, could have created the universe and that he placed the stars so far apart from one another so as they would not fall on each other mutually. Science is partly responsible also for the birth of democracy. Natural law, or the belief that humans use reason to choose between right and wrong or good and evil, led to natural rights such as freedom. Scientists believe they could improve society by changing the government. All right, so last thing we're gonna talk about is a whole new world using scientific thought. Can you imagine school without science class? We've grown up studying science, whether we enjoy it or not, because it's who we are. Most people are inquisitive and want to know more about the world around them. When the scientific revolution began, it sparked a greater interest in learning and education. Colleges and universities had been around for centuries, having started in the Muslim world, but the revolution forced the creation of more institutions of higher learning. By the 15th century, more than 100 universities and dozens of academic schools were teaching students in Europe, Asia, and the New World. Most universities were modeled after the ones in Europe, which were originally required to be started by the Pope or the monarch. As such, most only offer classes in theology, which is the study of God and religion, or seminary, classes that train priests. Gradually though, as the scientific revolution gained momentum, universities became, began offering majors in the arts and the science, sciences, medicine, and law. Three schools of higher education were founded in America at the end of the 17th century. The oldest, Harvard University, was started in Massachusetts in 1636. It was followed by the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, and St. John's College in Maryland. By early 18th century, universities were op operating across North and South America. In the United States, nearly two dozen were educating an eager, growing population. All right, so that we're going to end here um, for this video. Um, so we talked about the scientific revolution, the important people, the changes in thought from a religious backing in the church dominating life to a more scientific approach to life. How did we get to be here? Okay, so being able to open up the process of thinking for ourselves and the, thinking about the natural world and how we ended up here brought us to the scientific revolution and out of the dark ages of only focusing on religion. So your assignment for this video is going to be to click on the link at the on the bottom at the description of the video, and it's going to be a worksheet where you're going to have to analyze an image. Okay, so we've done these before where you have questions about an image shown and you have to analyze it, okay? You're gonna either print them out, fill it out, and show me in our Zoom meetings Wednesday at 9.30, or you can email it back to me um, with your answers as well, okay? Make sure you do that, because if you do both assignments this week, you get entered to win a $25 gift card. So make sure you do that. All right, guys, we'll see you next time. Bye.